I think there are some things that we can start with. <clears throat> I'm Harlan Jacobson. I'm um, back in the States. I'm a, a film critic and a film programmer. I spent a little bit of time in my wild youth being a reporter for Variety, the show business entertainment paper. Um, and then I worked at the Film Society of Lincoln Center, which publishes a magazine maybe some of you film students film, have read called Film Comment. I was the editor for a decade. Then I covered film festivals for USA Today for many years, um, as well as various and sundry, thank you, dear, other American newspapers like the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I covered for a paper in Germany. Um, and I have long time experience going to some of the principal festivals around the world, Tuck Toronto, um, Cannes, uh, Sundance, etc. So you should know a little bit about your, your moderator. Uh, and then that's about it. Because it also gives me a lot of pleasure to be here and participate in RIF um, uh, at their Reykjavik Film Festival. Um, because it's a great meeting place for uh, filmmakers, I believe, and for politicians, as you know. It's in the DNA of, of the Icelandic temperament to be a place where people can meet and discuss um, all of the issues that are outstanding in the world. Um, and that's one of the great things that film does. Film it allows us to drop down and be voyeurs, flies on the wall, as the great issues of the world are being explored in the character development of stories, particularly true when it's a, a non-Hollywood film for the most part, uh, which the rest of the world is. Uh, we look at stories and we look at the great issues of the world through the people on screen, and we can come to a place like Riff and have a meeting about it uh, because it's, it's in the DNA of Iceland to do that. And so we have uh, two really quite wonderful filmmakers who were brought to the festival um, to explore some of their films and to have this class where we can, or not really a class, but a discussion where we can talk about um, uh, film and the filmmakers. To my far left is Laurent Conte. He's really one of the great, um, uh, young French filmmakers of the uh, uh, late 80s, 90s, and, and contemporary, uh, contemporary filmmakers. And <clears throat> we're privileged to see three of his films here. Uh, Time Out, which I think is an absolute masterwork, and uh, later on is uh, the Human Resources, um, and his current film, Foxfire. Um, uh, Laurent, has, I think, been part of a really interesting uh, movement in France. Uh, perhaps he helped define it. Uh, to get away from all of those uh, obsessive French uh, family and personal romance films about, you know, love that just doesn't ever seem to work out, but sure makes a mess of things, and really take film into the heart of things in a very prescient fashion. Um, <clears throat> the heart of the, the way in which the world is structured and the economy uh, and the impact that globalization has on not only all of us, but also the future of France. Um, and he has done so brilliantly. Um, to my immediate left is James Gray, um, somebody I've gotten to know over the recent years and whose films are simply wonderful. Um, you had the chance to see a film that we brought here, his first film, Little Odessa, um, which he did at the age of 25, which is no darn fair, uh, because it's an absolutely brilliant, small, and perhaps uh, dark film, as films sometimes are of extremely young filmmakers, um, with a first-rate cast of people, uh, including <clears throat> Maximilian Schell uh, and Vanessa Redgrave, who were the senior members of the staff, which I can only imagine what it's like to be a 25-year-old saying, Vanessa, can you do that again, please? You know, I need more from you. I don't know if that happened, but... Um, and, uh, and Tim Roth and the early film of Ed Furlong, great film. And then uh, we showed Two Lovers, 
where between which is all uh, set in Brighton Beach and the the uh, the community of, of uh, Brighton Beach with Gwyneth Paltrow and Joaquin Phoenix, who has made three films with James, um, and his four shows you what I know, and um, his most current film, um, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. The Immigrant, thank you, which I saw in competition at Cannes, um, and which, in which Joaquin Phoenix returns uh, to play a role um, that is uh, quite haunting. Uh, it's set in 1920s New York and the wave of immigration that uh, was really nearing its end in, in the United States. And uh, with a cast that included Marion Cotillard. And what all of this, uh, both of them share is participation in the Cannes Film Festival um, uh, with uh, varying sorts of triumphs and near triumphs at Cannes, but they all share a vision, both share a vision of real people um, leading um, extremely uh, regular lives that are, are in some sense um, working out the, 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 the conflicts um, in the culture um, of their day. And that's why it's a pleasure to be able to see filmmakers who are engaged um, with the world. Um, and I, I often tell people that cinema is not just about entertainment, it's about engagement. And I think it's a real privilege to have filmmakers with us today who um, represent engagement particularly. So I want to start by um, asking them a few questions. Um, and then you should be thinking some of the things that you would like to either ask or say in relationship to the films that uh, you have seen of their work, or films that you uh, think uh, are important to talk about, um, or filmmaking. So you'd be thinking about some of the things. This is your opportunity to say things or ask things um, in a, what I would say is a lovely and intimate setting where we can feel like this is a living room and we can relax and just have a decent conversation. Okay. Having said that, Laurent, I'd like to start with you. Um, and that's this, to, to build on that um, in, uh, introduction a little bit. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how you came to filmmaking. I think people would like to know. You were a, um, a fine young fellow growing up and going to good schools in France. And you decided at some point that cinema was important to you and that you wanted to do that. Tell us the process, the mechanics of how you went uh, from a, a, you know, school into um, a career in film. It was so long ago that I don't remember exactly my motivations. Bring the, bring the mic a little closer. But um, no, I, I don't think I had this uh, idea long before trying. You know, I think. It, I learned how to make film in the school, and I went in this school by, I think, by chance. It's, uh, it was something right. I, I used to make photos, still photos, and I was uh, more and more interested in telling stories. And I would write uh, some stories without thinking of making films. And I had the chance to to enter this uh, school, and. I think it's really by making things that I really realized that it was very important for me. And, uh, but it took me a long time to, to really feel strong enough to, to make my own films. And I think I needed time, I needed to, to get older. And I, I took this time very, very uh, quietly. Without uh, being sure of what would happen, and but I think that things happened, and that's what I like in, in life too. You know, to be surprised at what happens to you and just help things sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're young and you want to make films, what's the process? Um, you know, what's the support structure in the states? You know, maybe actually. James will jumpstart this a little bit. Tell us a little bit about in the States, what's the support structure for your being a young filmmaker? Who do you have to go out and see? Do you, how do you get an agent? Do you go to a film school? Do you get a, 
Uh, is that all about getting a, you know, a, a working lexicography of film terms? What, what does it for you that, make, that pushes you over into the ability to work? A very important step for me was, of course, the school, where I learned everything about making a film. But also what happened just after, with four friends, we created a small production company uh, where all of us made our first uh, short films with friends who were technicians who worked on, on our films. And there was sort of a cooperative of production that, uh, that was very open to everything. You know, we didn't have any idea of what uh, producing a film would mean. And so we tried and we managed to, to make our first short film for, for me, uh, some features too. And this small family we created in this structure is still very important for me. And the people I'm working with now are the ones who were in this uh, company. And I think it's made in, for me by the most important thing to have this small family around me and to be able to call them anytime to, to talk about the, the script uh, or to get their feeling about the, 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 the editing and to, uh, right, it's very, very, very helpful for me because it helps me to trust myself. Well, one of the things that you brought into filmmaking um, uh, in the 90s <clears throat> was this desire to leave Paris um, and go into the heartland of France, the villages and the towns, and talk about bigger issues, you know, than merely, it's not to demean, you know, the personal relationship, but it's to say, you know, people are struggling in their lives, um, and the forces that sometimes they struggle with are bigger than they are. It, it is about globalization. There is an economic problem. There are, you know, sub rosa under the table political issues that are affecting them, the way in which they relate. Nothing illustrates that more than uh, human resources. If you haven't seen it, it's a story a, a set in a, a, in a town in France in which, <clears throat> in inside of a factory, uh, the young son of the shop foreman who comes back from um, a, a graduate course of study where he gets the equivalent of a business degree, goes to work in management, essentially overseeing uh, even his own father, who is, is the foreman, and um, leads to the inevitable sort of conflict between management and labor. Well, that, you know, that all seems so obvious now, but it, it was so prescient in 1995. So and you had to sell that. You had to convince people, hey, you know, this is real. We should do this. I think the chance I had this, uh, that this moment was that uh, this thing was made for TV. This thing was made for Arte, which is a cultural channel in, in France. And there was a man at the top of the, um, of the production uh, team who trusted me. And uh, right, I gave him the, the script and uh, I told him that what interested me the most was to work with real workers, real um, bosses people who could bring their own experience to the film. And I think that's what really uh, interested him uh, at the first point. And so we made the film the way I wanted to make it, and in a total freedom, because it was uh, a very small production, it was for TV, it was, and this guy had uh, a very, very strong um, idea of what freedom mean, means. And uh, so we showed the film in some festival, and uh, they, the, the, the reaction was very good, and so we get the, the authorization to, to release it in cinema, mm -hmm. which was uh, something very rare in France, because you know, we share the two, two systems. You know? And uh, I remember when, when I made the film, people would tell me, do you think that people who have spent their day working would come to see uh, how it, what, what's happening in a factory, how people work, how people 
uh, struggle for, for living. And it was, it was not obvious at that moment. And I think it, it was, um, right, the, the TV production was the only way to, to produce it at that moment. And maybe um, it happens at the moment of history where, where it was very important to think about all those things. We were still in a moment within 95, mm -hmm. 96, and we were still optimistic, I think. And we were also thinking that uh, class struggle doesn't exist anymore, that we would live in would be living in, in a, a peaceful society where everybody could talk together, where the, we would reach a sort of uh, harmony, social harmony. And uh, what I wanted to say to the film was that the, the, the class still exists, that the, the struggle still exists, and that uh, we could look at this, the, 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 the actuality, the, 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 Uh, the present time through this uh, filter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> James, <clears throat> you both actually start making films in the mid mid nineties. Um, you are were a resident of New York City. You grew up in one of the boroughs, um, and more particularly, you have a, a real sense of of a certain community. Um, in New York, uh, the, the Russian uh, Jewish emigre at a certain time. Um, but when you're uh, coming up as a young man, um, and you face uh, the prospects of entering the film industry, um, it's a difficult mountain to climb. And when you think of all of the the uh, films that come out from Hollywood. If, if all of you can just check your cell phone, um, turn off, put it on mute, and sort of let yourself be here, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> you face the prospect of how to break into the film industry. Uh, that's a pretty daunting climb. Um, and tell us a little bit about how you decided to transform yourself from the sons of immigrants um, into a filmmaker in a business that may well have, and definitely did start as an immigrant business, but had long since forgotten that it, it was an immigrant business and with some responsibility to show the immigrant experience, a la the gangster films of the 30s, Scarface and, and, uh, and, and you name it, and uh, has now become kind of an establishment uh, industry. And you have an outside vision in a film like Little Odessa, which is about uh, an immigration and a family that has made it to the shores of the United States, but somehow or other is in the process of breaking up and failing um, with a particularly interesting ending, you know, which we can talk about in some detail if you want, but nevertheless, it bears on your deciding, gee, I want to join up, I want to be a filmmaker, I want to be able to bring what is a decidedly personal vision into a film industry that really doesn't terribly much want personal visions, and you cross the threshold. Some numbers of these you know, folks are, may well be young uh, filmmakers in the making, and they've got their own little mountain to climb to make it in, um, and would be interested in hearing how do you transform yourself from kid to uh, cinema, uh, cinema tour. I want to say something very corny first, if I can, which is that I'm very honored to be here in Iceland and especially seated next to Mr. Laurent Canté, who I think is a great director. And when somebody asked me who I thought was the, uh, who I, whose films I liked working today, I think I mentioned like two people in the world, that's David Lynch and Laurent Canté, and now here he is sitting to my left. It's very strange. Um, uh, my, I, I, my father told me, I loved movies, and my father told me, he said, I said, I want to be a filmmaker. My father said, don't do that, you'll never make it. We have no connection. Stop thinking about that right now. <laughs> he told me, this was about 1983, he said that I should go into computers. He said there was a company called Microsoft. 
that have potential. <laughs> so uh, instead of flying economy class here, I would have flown on my private jet had I listened to him. You never but listened, I right? No, I didn't right. listen. Um, no, I mean, my story is, you see, in, in the United States, everybody becomes a film director, who is a film director, in a different way. There's no one real route to do it. And what happened with me was that I, I had watched a billion movies in my teenage years because I hated school and I was bad at it. And I was considered very slow, which is probably abundantly clear to the audience today. And uh, the only thing I really cared about was movies and basketball and baseball. And I never thought of it as a career. I started making these little Super 8 films. And when I had to go to college, the only way that we could afford college was on a scholarship. And the University of Southern California decided to recruit me because I was from New York and I guess they needed people from New York. I got to USC, and my parents really hated the idea. They wanted me to do something else with my life, as I said. When I got there, I found that it was, I was completely different from everybody else at the school, for better and for worse. That most of my classmates, uh, there were only about 30, it's a very small school, were extremely interested in I guess you would say the, the most important movie to them in general was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I remember very distinctly the guy running the film school, he said, I'm going to go around the class and I want you to tell me what your favorite movie is. And I remember it was like, Raiders, Jaws, Star Wars, Raiders, Jaws, Star Wars, Raiders, Jaws, Star Wars, Rocco and his brothers. Raiders, Star, Star Wars, Jaws, Star Wars, and I was the, the weird, you know, artsy, pretentious guy. But it was because I was from New York and I had had access to all these revival houses and seen all these old movies. I made a short film in college, which is really bad, but for a couple of very silly reasons, it was seen by agents and producers who seemed to like it, and got to make my film, as you said, actually I was 23 when I started shooting it. Uh, and I, thinking back on it now, I had such little knowledge that I would never have hired me in a million years. It was such a mistake to give me the money, because I didn't know what I was doing at all. I remember they said, would you like a call sheet, which is the thing that says what you're doing. I said, yes. I didn't know the I didn't call sheet. And all of a sudden I asked, thank you for the call sheet. And then I, rem I remember in rehearsal, Tim Roth saying to me, well, we figured out what to do on the day. And I said, yes, on the day. What does that mean? Uh, you asked about Vanessa Redwood, by the way. The one thing that I never lacked to my ultimate detriment is a very big ego. And there's a kind of stupidity that goes along with a big ego, you know. And uh, I have been humbled many times since then. But at the time, I remember thinking, I'm fantastic. And it presented no problems as a result asking Vanessa Redgrave for more takes. Now, I think about it now, it's insanity. But at the time, I remember saying, yeah, that's a little too much. Let's do it again, good enough. It's Vanessa Redgrave, you know. So I guess what I'm saying is there's a kind of stupidity which is very helpful. You know, when you don't know what you don't know, when you don't know what the real risks are, and you just sort of dive into it, and you want to make a personal story, and your ego is so big that you think everybody's going to want to know your personal story, that's very helpful. So I would say, in a way, to be stupid, you know, to just dive in, because there's no art without risk. So. Uh, that's how I made it. There are many other people have very different stories, but film school was important to me. Well, this is a question for both of you. <clears throat> you know, if you go to work, if you come out of school and you get an MBA or a law degree or what have you, and you, you go to work for a law firm or you go to work for um, a, a company in some way, <clears throat> you find a job that matches your skills and you may be young and you may be afraid, but you go to work and you do your job and you 
gain some experience and you gradually, there's an institutional way to, to um, gain experience and with experience comes authority. But when you're, I guess, an artist, right? And because that's, that's the company you joined, is the company of artists, you have to create something. You have to make something new. And you have to put it out there in the world and it's fraught with anxiety to get up in the morning and be part of an endeavor in which you create something and risk rejection. It isn't just that you feel bad, you know, when people say your film doesn't work or your piece, your art doesn't work. It's that it has also personal repercussions in terms of how you will work, you know, tomorrow and the next day. And those two things are sort of interwaste. The feelings that, you know, I'm an idiot and I made a piece of junk. Uh, and everybody hates me and they know what my face looks like. And also, nobody's going to send me any more money and I'm going to end up, you know, hopefully bringing the first McDonald's franchise to Iceland. You know, this is what it, this is what it takes, this is what it means. So, there's a whole lot of anxiety that's attached to this and you know how various people in the business handle anxiety. Some drink, some, you know, get, you know, five wives, some go to drugs, some, all of the things that are all, are, are all about anxiety. So, talk a little bit about what that anxiety feels like to put yourself out there when you're doing a story um, and how you, how you personally you know, deal with it. What does it mean to you to say, okay, they say I'm an artist, must be. My job is to make a film that, where the mechanics of the business can get around it and put it out there and make it, make it work in the world. Um, how, do you, how do you come to think that, yeah, that's, that's what I do and I'm gonna do it? I think that uh, my strength is that I'm not always aware of uh, what it means to, to, to make a film when you're not in on the stage, you just dream of it and then one day the machine is on and right, you can't stop it. And I think that's uh, maybe the only reason why I'm making films. At one point I always dreamed that I would break my leg to the day before shooting just to avoid it, you know. <laughs> but it's too late. You have to go, you have to go. And at that moment, uh, I think what's very, very important is the people surrounding you. And, and I think that that's the most important thing for me to choose people I'm working with and who really help me to, to, mm -hmm. to bear this moment of uh, anxiety. Of course, after three or four days of shooting, it's getting better. You forget all the, the, the problem and you, do, you are just facing small problem that you have to solve and then another one and then another one. And it's right, just uh, a, a sort of machine that, that has to, to go on, I think. Mm -hmm. I've, I've handled it very poorly. Uh, for the most part, because I feel like when people say your movie is no good or whatever, it's very, it, it's it's public. There's a kind of public humiliation that goes along with it, which is very difficult to deal with. And I think that my my parents made a major mistake in raising me. They did some things right, but a major mistake they made was to tell me how terrific I was, because. The rest of the world doesn't see you like that. And I had this misperception, like I said, that I was fabulous. And I remember the day that my ego died, and we can talk about this in terms of you know, public and what the public feels about you and the pressure of that and how you deal with it. I remember shooting Little Odessa and thinking every day I would go to dailies, because you used to watch them on film back then, and I'd say, my God, that's great. That's so good. And then March 9th, 1994, I walked to see the editor's assembly, and it was the worst thing I ever saw in my life. And before that, I thought I was great, and after that, I've now felt since that it's always trying to save the thing. And when there is a kind of... I've never made a film which has gotten all bad reviews, or all great reviews for that matter, but I always believe the bad ones that I get sent, usually, by the way, by my good friends. <laughs> and I, I think it's very harmful because you have to be, again, I say stupidity, in a way facetious, but not. You have to have such confidence, and that confidence is so fragile. 
So I, I'm very bad at ignoring outside voices. People tell me I stink. Because I should ignore them. I should also ignore anybody who tells me I'm any good. But because it's so connected to the reason you want to make films, e ego is so, I keep coming back to that because you're saying give me millions of dollars so that everyone can look at what it is I have to say, then you need a sense of self. And that is in contradiction to so many other things. So I go through periods, in total candor, I go through periods of great depression. And I'm sure I'm very difficult to be married to. My wife would attest to that. But you just fight through it. I mean, I'm not going house to house in Iraq, you know, so my life is better, you know, than most people's in many respects. I get to do what I want to do and to try to be an artist, and that's a wonderful gift. But by the same token, I do deal with depression. Mm -hmm. um, before I open this up to you guys, so <clears throat> start thinking about what you want to say or ask. I want to talk to you, East, ask you East about, ask you each about um, uh, your most current film, which you brought here, and in your case, Laurent, is Fox Fire, which um, <clears throat> is extremely uh, interesting because for a number of reasons. The one is in in 2008. If, if those of you who don't know, his film Entre les Murs, uh, which we know as the class distributed in the United States by Sony Pictures Classics, won the Palme d'Or uh, in Cannes that year up against a number of really great films like uh, Matthew Garon's um, uh, Gamora um, and Che and a film called Changeling by Clint Eastwood, who I think was on the jury. No. No, he wasn't on the jury. And a little film called Two Lovers by um, a fine fellow named James Gray, um, and after, uh, which was, and it was a quite wonderful film, we could talk about that at, at, at a little bit. Um, but next, you decided to uh, take a pretty big leap, which is to make a film in English, um, based on a Joyce Carol Oates novel, um, set, it's a period film, it's set in the 1950s in upstate New York. Um, it's with a, a cast of people who were either unknowns or lesser knowns to, to, to most folks. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting film about a group of girls who form their own little sort of secret uh, society in a very hierarchical, you know, male, you know, redneck, what people don't know about New York State if you're not from the States is that you get outside of about a 70 mile radius of New York and you might as well be in Arkansas. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, talk to us about that process of going from the Pomodoro to saying, okay, I'm gonna make a film in English. Why did you do it? And how did, what were the obstacles to doing it? And how do you feel about the way in which it all sort of has turned out? And what are the prospects for that film now? So first, there, there was no premeditation from me, you know, I just, uh, Finished the, the the class. I spent one year traveling all over all over the world to, to present the film. And uh, during this time, I read the book by Joyce Carol Oates, and I felt very close to the book. I had the feeling that all my all the the, the, the issues I like to 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 look at in my films were gathered in this story. And uh, right, I don't think I even think about all the difficulties I could face to make it. I first tried to, to transpose it in France because I didn't, right, it was not a purpose for me to, to make a, uh, an American film. I wanted to make this film. And so I tried to, to, to find a, a way to, to, to shoot it in French and in France. And I couldn't believe to what, what I would write at that moment because all the, the, the images that came to me during the when I was reading the book were American, I think. And after a few months of hesitations, I decided to try to make it in English uh, without exactly knowing how it would happen. I didn't even know if the film would 
would exist at the end. You know, I wrote the, the script with a friend of mine without uh, without getting the rights, and so we just needed to write it. Um, after I don't know what one year, we finally get the rights to to, to the, for the remake uh, rights because uh, because the film has already been made in 1995, I guess. And I like to I like to imagine I like to film uh, far away from my home. I like to go somewhere else and try to uh, emerge myself in in a reality that is not mine. Because I think I'm looking with more curiosity about things that happens. And also I need maybe more intervention intervention from from the others. I like to. To listen to what the, the characters, or the actors, for example, have to say about their characters, the way they they, they deal with it, and it's um, yes, I think all the preparation work is is more exciting for me than filming in Paris or in a place that I know that so well that I even don't look at it anymore. And you filmed this. Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada, yes. on top of everything. So the actual deal was a deal, a co-production between French French producers like Oe Kerr and um, I forgot the other one. Uh, film Farm from, and, from Film Farm. Film Farm. From and, Toronto, yeah. and Alliance, uh, which is a Canadian company, um, couldn't get further away from you know Paris, I guess, than than somewhere in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Um, did that work? Uh, are you happy about that? The way in which you went to, you know, Canada to, you know, do the U.S. Yes, I think so. Uh, right, I don't know how what it means to shoot in U.S. But yeah. uh, uh, I think the relation I had with the production in, in Canada was so good that it was, uh, you know, maybe just like I used to work with a small family and people who are really involved in the project and. And I'm not sure it would have been possible in the States, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can answer better than I do. Uh, the, the, it was, of course, there was the problem of the, of the language and how to, to, do, to work with people without uh, speaking that well. And again, I think well, I spent a lot of time uh, making the casting, and at one point I thought that I found the good uh, actors, actresses, more more actresses than actors, and I think I trusted them, and I just thought they were so good that they couldn't uh, betray the, 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 the script, you know. Mm -hmm. um, James. Uh the three films that we brought here, Little Odessa, Two Lovers, and The Immigrant, uh, are films that I picked to bring, and I think I picked them because um, I love them, and because I love I love them because they're very personal, you know, uh, films. They're handmade films, if you will, as opposed to machine-made films, and they deal with the immigrant experience in America. Um, I, I, I went back and, and resaw them and loved them more. Uh, because of it, because um, they are so truthful to milieu and people, um, and they're so subtle and shaded in what they say. And in the case of Little Odessa, as I mentioned before, uh, the work of a young filmmaker, which has such an ironic and dark ending, which we it is the luxury that we afford young filmmakers. Um, I think it's a flaw, by the way. We can talk about that. Okay, no, I'd love to hear you about it because I, I thought I saw the ending in a, in a way, you know, 20 years later that I didn't think I got 20 years ago, which is one of the great things. We were talking about Roger Ebert this morning. One of the great things that Roger always said was, you know, it's interesting to go back and see films that you saw, you know, when you were a different time in your life and years earlier because the film don't change, you do. And so, um, uh, looking at the ending, you know, which we can talk about, uh, was astonishing because I think I understood it in a way that hmm, I didn't the first time. But my point is, is that you deal with a very specific 
uh, group of people and a very important topic in the American you know, political and social landscape, which is immigration. Um, and you come to uh, this film, The Immigrant, and it's a very sly, subtle film because uh, it, uh, f by way of examining characters who start out as legal immigration during a period of uh, Ill uh, legal immigration, start out as legal immigrants during a period of illegal, start out as legal immigrants in a period of legal immigration, end up through bureaucratic stupidity uh, or rigidity becoming illegal immigrants, and so it contextualizes the question of illegal immigrants, which is very much fought out now in the United States political landscape. So you come to that film um, uh, by intention to be able to address that subject, uh, and it's part of what I think of your ability, your desire, to bring personal American films, or tourist, if you will, American films, into the marketplace that may or may not be set up or even receptive to that kind of thing when the world is all about, you know, the Dark Knight and Superman, Man of Steel, uh, in a business in a business that has one template, which is big, 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 stupid, stupid, stupid. Well, it wasn't always like that. See, the, I my taste is frozen more or less for American movies anyway. Around 1980, 81, up up until that point. What you're talking about now, Harlan, is quite true. Obviously, in American cinema, it's all about men wearing tights. But that, but it was not always thus, right? I mean, the most popular movie ever in terms of ticket sales is Gone with the Wind. And the ending of that movie, he leaves her. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. This idea that Hollywood cinema always sold only the happy ending is nonsense. What is actually more interesting to me is as an American, I always felt the need to pursue classical cinema, that is to say, telling a story straightforwardly, but finding a way to bring a certain subtext that was personal. This is why I always admired Alfred Hitchcock and John Ford. They were able to bring their personal commitment to really a genre story. That's what I saw in part of the American tradition. Now, Laurent makes incredible films in a quite different tradition. What you learn is that there is no one way to make a marvelous film. So Laurent says he wants to go and find something that isn't about himself and discover something else. And frankly, I've always tried to do exactly the opposite, which is to always try and examine what it is that I'm concerned about, telling it as personally as I can, as autobiographical. Now, his films are personal, but he comes at it from a different way. Um, I've always tried to stick as autobiographically as I could, and my own family, which is an immigrant family, I just basically stole their attitudes, their statements. I remember I used to take a tape recorder, and I planted it under the sofa in the living room to try and tape record conversations my parents would have. This was as a teenager, so I could steal the dialogue, make it as accurate as I could. By the way, that does not work, because what you realize is people don't really talk the way they do in movies, and when you try to do that, it seems fake. <laughs> real life is not real in movies. But I haven't really answered your question at all, except to say that the only thing that I think I can do, and other people handle it very differently, is to explore my, my own feelings and my family's feelings as much as I can. Now, you talked about the ending to Little Odessa, which I said I think is a flaw. It's a flaw because the ending is, it's the ending of a young man. It's too dark. The truth is, is that the best endings, which by the way is why the ending of his film Time Out is perfect, the best endings are not upbeat or downbeat. Upbeat is fake. We recognize that upbeat is usually bogus. But downbeat is also bogus. Downbeat is gratuitous, because life is not just misery. So it was a flaw that I, I have to say I'm trying to get over that now, but I don't think I've quite gotten over the hump. I think there's still a, they err a little bit on the downbeat side. I think I've gotten closest to it in the, the current film I just made. But it's a very difficult question, really, for artists, you know, how to end something. And I, I think we can talk about that more if you want. But. Well, I'll, maybe I'll come back a little later to the question of the ending. 
it seems to be planning a, a sound recording device, MB3 or tape or whatever it is in a sofa runs certain kinds of risks that you, know, you might not want to talk about. It was um, much more boring than you might think, Colin. Huh? It was really boring. As long as it didn't sound like, you know, thunder was going on. In the, no. <laughs> never mind. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Let's open this up to uh, you folks. Um, we'd like to hear what you have to say, what your thoughts are, or what your questions are. Um, so can I have a person out there uh, who wants to jump into the pool, and we'll bring the mic to you so that you can speak directly into the mic. Who's out there? Hands up. Let's see who wants to talk. Uh, a little hard to see, but uh, there we go. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you two could think about something specific that you learned along the way in your career and that you wished you would have known from the very beginning as a filmmaker. I don't think I learned anything since I'm a filmmaker. I have the same kind of uh, anxiety when I'm starting a film. I have the same kind of uh, problem to, to, to solve. And the only thing maybe that I get, that I got, is to just uh, de de dramatize. Yeah, de dramatize the, 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 the problems, right? But um, what I what I like more and more now is to accept accident during during shooting, mm. and to not just accept them, but even create them, create all the, 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 the create the possibility of accidents, which makes me feel maybe more uh, vulnerable in front of the of the film I'm making, and also more excited because you are not just waiting for something to to happen the, the way you, you thought it would happen, but you can be surprised by what, what's happening in front of your camera. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm, what I'm always trying to, to get now. Okay. Yeah. Andrew. I, I would say, uh, it's a very good question you ask, and it's also very difficult, because every time you make a new film, an entirely new set of problems dramatically emerges. One of the problems is that experience serves you not at all. It's true, right? I mean, if you look at the careers of even the most brilliant filmmakers, I mean, let's be candid here, most of the movies are not great, right? If you make three or four great movies, you're fabulous. Hall of Fame. So you have to reinvent the wheel every time a movie is made, and that's a kind of a shock to the system. Because you can't, oh, I learned that on that last movie, and I'm gonna do it, and it doesn't work that way. You can't fight the previous war. So what I think I would say is, I think I've learned one thing, which is how hard it is, and how really, in my case, I'm not an artist at all. I would consider myself an attempt at becoming a craftsman because it is a craft, and you have to kind of work at it. And this idea, which is incredibly harmful to people who want to make films, this idea of genius, I think is one of the most fake ideas ever. First of all, it's a collaborative medium, but more than that, this idea of genius somehow means that you don't have to work at it, like a lightning bolt hits you, you're so special and it's gonna be great. It doesn't work like that. It's a craft that you develop. Think of it this way. Uh, the first great film by Alfred Hitchcock, what would you say it is? First really great film, maybe Notorious, maybe before that. Yeah. Be generous, let's say Rebecca, I don't know, I think that's over long, but okay. Yeah, no, let's go with uh, Notorious. Okay, we'll go with Notorious 1946, I think, right? He'd been making movies for 15 years, he'd had 15 movies before that. So, I think the thing to realize is that you are going to have to keep working at it. And this idea of genius is, this idea of inspiration, forget it. Just think about working at it, and working at it, and getting better that way. And all those years, Hitchcock ran away from being described as an artist as well, because he oh, knew yeah, that it, 
you knew that if you described him as an artist, he was screwed. He'd never get a job again in Hollywood. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's have a hand. Yeah, down front here, and then after that, another hand, so we can get a little order to the process here, up in the balcony. So when this question is done, please go up to the balcony to the right. Okay. Okay, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your work with actors? Know uh, how do you go, do, uh, go about it, or what's important in that process for you, you know, from the casting to rehearsal and shooting? Um, that, another thing I, I did learn, I should have answered this this way, but I didn't think about it, is every actor is quite different. Um, and there's no rule about how to work with each and every one of them. Um, I, and again, also, all directors work with actors very differently. The thing to focus on, I think, uh, for, for me anyway, the thing to focus on is that really the director is the one kind of useless person on the set in one respect. So you're making a film, you have the director of photography, he hangs all the lights, and in some cases, although not, not in my case, but in some cases, chooses the shot and the lenses. The editor cuts it together, the actors act. So what does the director really do? Well, the director wouldn't have to do really anything, and the movie might actually get finished. In my case, it might actually be a better movie if I just sat back and sang it. But what, the, so what does that mean? The director really brings one thing, which is the emotional temperature of the scene. The mood of the scene, the pace of the scene, how the actors perform the dialogue. So in my case, I like some, a lot of discussion, not rehearsal. I find rehearsal a waste of time. I know some directors did it a lot, like, you know, Sidney Lumet used to map out the, the room with tape, and he'd say, all right, love, you would come in here, and you go over here, and you sit there. And I do not understand that at all, because every time I get to the set, it's completely different from the room in the story of Queens where I did my rehearsals. So I never understood that logic at all. What I find is clear the set in the morning, after discussion before shooting, and start talking with the actors and seeing how they can contribute. So my first thing about how to stage the scene, I always say to the actor, show me. Show me what it is you like, what makes you comfortable. And then I always try to adjust, by the way, the camera, where the camera goes to them. And then really it's a matter of, not, only, not just faster and slower, but really how much emotional intensity is brought to what they're doing or not how much to restrain or not, how much to show the audience or not. That is a matter totally of personal taste. So there is nothing that I could say that would inform this discussion intelligently at all for you. So there are some people, for example, who love the films of uh, Bresson, Robert Bresson. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those movies, but they're very restrained. And then there are other people who love, you know, who would be like, uh, like Douglas Sirk, like Melodrama, I happen to think both are great. The only thing I think is, is the film consistent and emotionally committed? Does the artist, or in, I say the craftsman, but the artist really, if they become, a, they become such a good craftsman, become an artist, is the artist committed to the emotion in the scene? And once that is apparent to me, once the director has shown that he or she believes the material, then I will go with what the actor is doing. Does this make any sense? It's a very elusive thing you're asking me because it's such a personal taste issue. And Laurent, you work so often with, you know, people who don't have egos because they don't have careers, you know, they're not big deals. Talk about that. No, I, I like to work with non-professional actors because maybe of this uh, desire of accident that I, that I like, you know, even if, uh, if uh, you trust them, of course, things that don't happen exactly the way you were expecting, and that's what I like. Uh, I also like to face actors that I never saw before, and I don't need to uh, forget the image I had from them, of them from another field, for example, and so that's important for me. But, uh, in the, in the principle, I'm working exactly the same way as uh, James. Uh, for me, the, the actors are really the, the center of the, of the scene. And I don't have any, any uh, pre-conception of what the scene will be. I just 
arrive on the set and just try to make them play the, the, the scene and see the way they move in the, in, the, in the set, on the set, the way they decide to be close together or far away from the others. And I always trust this first feeling. Sometimes I have to change a few things about it just because uh, it doesn't fit with my conception, but usually I accept the, the, the way they, they propose it. And since uh, my, so since the class, I'm working now with two or three cameras at the same time, uh, just because uh, I think it's important for the actors to be able to play the scene, to act the scene from the very beginning to the very end. I don't like to cut the camera and make one shot on him, one shot on him, and then the reverse shot. Uh, I prefer to have the, the whole the old scene because I think the actors are much better when they are really carried by the, 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 the real energy of the scene. So that made me change my, my uh, method of working, but I, I think it's uh, I think that now I found something that, for the moment, for me is the, is very efficient, because I want to 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 make them really uh, build the, the the scene the way they, they would leave it. No, 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 so one other thing I would add. I'm sorry, because he said something that's very important. Um, one thing I another thing I did learn from a practical. I I, I now roll on everything. I don't let the technicians do a camera rehearsal because of. Something he said reminded me, you're never sure when a beautiful thing, an accident happens that enriches the scene immeasurably, and you can never then get it again. So all the sound people and the camera people ha hate it, but from the first rehearsal on, I'm always rolling film. I remember the first film I did, I did a rehearsal, Tim Roth's performance was unbelievable, and it was a master that I never got again. I never got his performance on that level again. And he said, oh, well, the problem is you should have shot it. <laughs> but it was the camera rehearsal. So the accident, what he's talking about, the unpredictability of it is the most beautiful thing that is part of the process of filmmaking, I think. Yeah, there is a, a gimmick of my shooting, which is, uh, so let, let's film the rehearsal. Mm. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, the you pressure's off, have... everybody feels they can put it out. Yeah, up in the balcony, please. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, uh, asking you about why would you think that uh, storytelling attracts people so much? You know, what do you think is the essence of, of this attraction? I think uh, you need to. What's this? Uh, I think, I, I, I think I, you need to come at that again. Say it again a little bit more clearly. It's a great question, actually. Oh yeah, uh, like storytelling, it attracts all kinds of people. You know, and through it, through the ages, we've always been like fascinated by stories. So I was thinking, like, what, what do you think is the essence of, of this attraction, really? What's the attraction of story through for, for everybody throughout history? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, like movies, there are stories. Yes, I understand uh, the question. And yeah, what what do you think is the thing that, that attracts people to it? You know. Yeah. You need to make sense of what is nonsense. Our okay, lives. Sorry, I'm probably are... just mixing the words together. Uh, how do what? I um, <laughs> I understand your question perfectly. Okay. okay. So it's a great question. Go ahead. Don't answer, worry. Answer. I get it. That's okay. great. We got it. Okay. Uh, sorry. Did you want to try and repeat it, or should I just go for it? No, you go for it. We need human beings need story because our lives are nonsensical and meaningless, and a large part of us knows that. And story organizes our lives in a way that. Uh, it doesn't really exist in the world, so it satisfies a real fantasy of ours. And it replicates the birth-life-death cycle in some way that, again, enables us to connect with other human beings. That's the one thing that is common to all of us, this, our mortality. So it's a form of religion, isn't it? That everybody has to kind of believe in story because it's what helps us manage through our lives. It's what helps us survive psychologically. When there is no story, don't you kind of feel, like when I see a movie has no story, you feel agitated? It's because all of a sudden it's breaking down that structure that we've learned to accept. Birth, life, death. 
That's what I think. Uh, I think that also what, what, what I realize when I show my films is that uh, people need to recognize themselves in a situation that, that is maybe bigger than their own life and realize how their own life is maybe part of the big uh, of a big uh, story and uh, for example when I sh made uh, the class I was very surprised to realize that a lot of teenagers who are not used to go to to see this kind of film would come in the theaters to see how their own life uh, had been represented by by a, a film and uh, it was of course, for them, a good way to uh, think about their own own way of living, and that's for me very important. Next uh, comment or question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you've got the mic. I see. I thought he did. Go ahead. Up there. Hello. Uh, I just have a question about your childhoods. I, I want to know what made you you. Why why you're interested in in, in art and, and movies, telling stories, not not Jaws but art artistic stuff. I really like Jaws, by the way. It's a good one. Too, yeah. But why wasn't it your favorite? Which one? Which was your favorite? I don't, I don't think you said. You're talking to me my favorite? Yeah, I said Rock, Rocco and his brothers at the time, it was Rocco and his brothers. Oh, okay. It was a movie by Luchino Visconti, <laughs> which if you've never seen it, is a great movie. You want to go first? Oh. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. For me, I can say I was, uh, I was, am, a was a gigantic loser. You know, I was awkward and very ugly and, and not particularly popular, and so I hid in a movie theater, and the movies seemed, like I said, I, I started watching movies in the late 70s, in a very different kind of movie, and it seemed to relate to my, what Laurent just said about the response to the class. There were issues that were discussed that I seemed to relate to directly. I remember seeing Raging Bull with my brother, and we sneaked in, I was very young, my, my brother and I thought it would be cool to see it. And even though, obviously, neither of us was a boxer in 1941, there were other things that we found incredibly authentic about it. His attitude, you know, the sort of New York life, and it seemed like my neighbors were on the screen. And that, to me, was incredibly exciting. So what was I as a child? I was a loser and I built a lot of model kits and I tried to play sports but I was bad at it and so the movies were a perfect escape. But it's strange because some people now, most people now watch films as escape with a quite a different meaning. So for example, they'll go see like, you know, Lord of the Rings and that fantasy allows them to escape completely. My form of escape was to identify which is a different thing. So I think that's the big cultural shift that's happened since the late 70s. But I really don't, I'm not objective about myself as a kid. I'm sure I was a schmuck, so it's hard for me to explain what I was as a kid. I can only tell you that I love movies because they seem to me to be the perfect escape. Well, I think that, that uh, it's true about people, particularly people who go into the film industry in some way, <clears throat> that there's a certain element of voyeurism and vicarious experience oh, that sort of uh, compensates for all of the maybe personal deficits that we may feel. And the difference between somebody who goes into the business of voyeurism uh, and decides that they want to make films versus criticize them is the difference of intelligence level. <laughs> So you were a loser and ugly, and I was a loser, ugly, and stupid. You know, where does that get me? Um, <clears throat> uh, but I think if I can build on that question, uh, the question actually is, is 
in, in my mind is, is, is this what your parents, you know, were comfortable with for you? Is this what they wanted um, for you? Did they see you as a, you know, maybe an MBA or a lawyer because it's a little safer? Or did they say, you want to make movies? Well, okay, you can make movies. Are they happy with, were they happy before you made the decision, not afterwards, because now, you know, you're Laurent Conte and you're James Gray, but then, you know, it was a, a much more uncertain kind of decision to make. I think my parents were wise enough not to make any plans for me and that they accepted everything that I decided to, to choose and right, helped me when, when I made my decision, but uh, right, there was no predestination game. I think I became a, a director by accident mm -hmm. and everybody accepted that, but it's just like me. Mm -hmm. What did your dad do? Sorry? What did your father do? Uh, they, both of them are teachers. They were both teachers, your mom yep. and your father? Yep. Yeah. And, and James? <laughs> How to describe what my father did and does. My father is a teacher, but he also tried to invent a heating system in the 70s, and it was sort of a disaster. <laughs> then he worked at a company which manufactured parts for subway trains in New York, and that was a disaster. I mean, a much more complicated thing, and my mother was a teacher, sort of. I don't know, they, they projected upon me, they thought I was going to be, you know... I don't know what they thought. I think they thought, they, I think they didn't know what to do with me. And, and I think even to this day, I mean, my mother's long dead, but my father, even to this day, I don't think he really appreciates that I did what I wanted to do. And I think his barometer of any success that I may, may, may have had or have is that I have health insurance. Because you know, he, you know, to him, he's a you know engineer, you know, so he, he can discuss with you how the blender works. But movies are not part of his, you know, that's not part of who he is at all. So I think he looks at me. My brother, for example, is a terrific guy and a very successful physician, a doctor, and and, and he's absolutely the pride of the family. Really. Yes. Well, there's a famous story about a president on that story. But, all right, let's have maybe a, a, another comment uh, down front and, uh, before we go. My microphone is here. Coming, coming, coming. Here she comes. Here she comes, here she comes. She turns the corner. Whoa! Okay. So I think it would be very challenging to have a conversation with Laurent Conte about the beauty of collaboration. So I wonder if you both could speak a little bit about collaboration and what's important to you about working with the other people who make your film. Yeah. Oh, I can start. I already answered to this question earlier when I told that uh, I think the, the, the most important step in my uh, career, let's say, is the first people I met in school and people uh, I'm still working with who create with me this small uh, production company and I need this family, it's essential for me and I, I'm always working with the same DP for example since the beginning because uh, I know we share more than just the film and the way of making a film, we share uh, Friendship. We we are we know each other for such a long time that we don't need to argue on a few things. You know, but I just uh, I just need this, and you know it's always very difficult to be on a, on a on, on a set and uh, feeling that people around you. Uh, are so close to you that they, they will tell you that there's something wrong or it's for me it's essential. Uh, for me it's incredibly important because uh, I, I, I have to say I have uh, many flaws. One of them is not not listening to people I'm working with and I see all the time, uh, I hate to say this, friends of mine who are directors and if they've written the script 
Or if they say, I have a vision for this and I'm going to see it through, I think that's a disaster because what it means is they are trying to force their original conception on it instead of allowing it to really to blossom. And the importance of collaborators is so, it's so crucial to the process because what happens is, is that I always say this, I don't want my vision. I don't want my vision on the screen. I want something that's better than my vision. And that's what happens if you have um, wonderful actors and a terrific cinematographer and editor. They are better at their jobs than you are at theirs. So it's the peak of arrogance to sort of say, I have all the good ideas. Now, the principal job of the director, other than setting the emotional temperature for the actors on the set, I think the really critical job is to say, okay, this idea and this idea will enlarge the scope of what it is I originally had in mind. That's excellent. That idea is bad. That will get in the way. Now, unfortunately, there is no rule book, so you have to kind of go by instinct. But it's what I come back to, this idea of solo genius, you know, the one man, one woman is a genius thing, is extremely harmful because if I believe in collective genius, I believe that a bunch of people working together can do something really amazing. But this idea of one person, it's very damaging to the creative process and it doesn't allow the thing to blossom and to be filled and brimming with life which is the coin of the realm for uh, what I think is a good movie. So the collaborative process really, I think, is everything. Since we are rapidly approaching um, the end, I want to actually <clears throat> delve into the question of the end uh, and the ending. I've decided to <clears throat> overlook your veneration of Douglas Sirk, who I don't happen to think was any good. Uh, we can have that fight privately later. Um, I can do that nicely as in I happen to disagree with you or I can just say, you know, Cirque was crap. We can have the fight. Like there's always tomorrow? It always sucks. He's just terrible. It's a horrible <laughs> development in film of rediscovery of Cirque. Well, see, that's where we are. But let's get to the, let's get to the question of, of um, the ending. And, uh, you know, when I look, I went back and I looked at Little Odessa, and I, I mean this question for both of you, you know, when I look back at Little Odessa, it ends uh, on a character who um, basically asks himself, where does he go now? He's, it's, he's radioactive. Everything he's touched, he's destroyed, whether intentionally or by, by accident. Uh, the innocent dies, uh, hope dies, uh, or dies. Uh, the only thing his father, you know, loves, you know, has uh, been killed. Um, he's poisoned uh, to everyone except perhaps his mother who dies. Uh, it's a profoundly deep and distressing uh, ending. It's a profoundly risky uh, ending. And in some ways, the implications of it were very Darwinian, you know. I mean, what it said was that the good die young, uh, only the strong survive. The strong are impossibly twisted and, uh, by experience. Um, and in some ways, because it was a, a Russian Jewish emigration to New York, it had a kind of implications even about who survived during the Holocaust. I mean, so holy smokes, if you have a vested interest in this question, it's a really unsettling ending. And in your case, Laurent, your films frequently have characters who end in a, in a way in which they are lost. Um, the character from Time Out uh, is wandering the landscape. The, the, you know, the character, what? Yeah, and, and the character, you know, even in the, the class, you know, the, the lead character, it's a, little, it's a little more resolute, but still, as to the overall social and economic questions of how are we gonna educate and integrate a population, you know, is unclear. Uh, and in the case, in the occasion, in the, on the occasion of, of uh, human resources, you know, basically things end 
uncertainly. You know, uh, the guy watch, walks out on his job and, and the future, but where is he? He's in a system in the country he no longer can believe in. He, you know, what's France? So the question is, what is the new ending now? Is this the new ending? And when you face the question of the ending, you know, is that what the template is? Is that things are too big, you know, um, to be a human being anymore and successfully battle the forces of darkness? Even when I'm a spectator, what I like is a film that asks me questions and don't give me answers. I like to be, you know, to be involved as a spectator in the in the in what the film is uh, trying to tell. And that's also what I'm trying to, to, to do when I'm writing. I think that uh, scripts are always too too logical, too, you know, um, how do you say, mechanically perfect. Yeah, you know? right. And that uh, it doesn't, uh, never happens like this in, in real life. You, you are facing answer, uh, questions, you don't have answers to them. And living, and what makes living uh, important for me is to, right, try to answer those questions, but not getting answers from anyone else and that's what I like to share with the spectators or with the film when I'm a spectator. Is there any pressure on you in your French production circles to end on some kind of completion where the characters in fact survive in a way that is m more than you know desperate? No, I, I don't think I ever had any pressure of, of that kind. I sometimes read some, some uh, reviews telling that the film didn't finish or something like that, but uh, but I right I don't I don't think it was uh, I, I take it as a, a good um, statement. Okay. James, last word. Um, the, to me, endings are uh, the hardest thing. You know, I, at the same time, I agree with everything Laurent said about you know the kind of the ambiguity of the terrific ending and something that is basically sets forth a series of questions, doesn't really answer them. Uh, at the same time, uh, I always like to look at, I, I think stealing from Shakespeare is a really good idea because he kind of knew all the answers. And um, I remember seeing a play called Measure for Measure, which is not even like tippy top Shakespeare, it's sort of middle. But the dilemma is incredible in it. And as a consequence, I started to read all these other plays by him, and I thought that the histories of Shakespeare had the perfect endings, because they always played both sides, which of course is a different way of saying what you're saying. Like, it gave you both emotions. I remember seeing or reading uh, Henry IV, uh, parts one and two, and at the end, of Henry IV, Part Two. Prince Hal becomes the king, which is a triumph for the character. But then his friend Falstaff comes up to him as he's being coronated. His friend, who's a complete screw up, and he says, "Basically, now that you're the king, you can really have a good time." And he turns to his friend Falstaff and he says, "I know thee not, old man." So, at the same time he's the king, he's saying to his good friend, goodbye. And the ending had both power, and it was upbeat, but it had darkness. And to me, that's life. So, what you're trying to do, of course, is to raise questions that you can't answer. That's incredibly important. And I think the key is to have it play without an easy or clear emotion. That doesn't mean it's vague. It means you're presenting a situation which involves several different emotions at the same time. It's unbelievably difficult to do that. I mean, the, the, one example of a perfect ending, you know, which is in a very Hollywood vein, but it's totally Shakespearean, is the ending of the first Godfather because Michael Corleone is the king. He's killed everybody. He's horrible. He's lying to Diane Keaton, he's basically Satan, but you're in awe of him, and he has power. 
It's incredible. It's like perfect. It's, it's uncomfortable, but satisfying. And, I mean, to me, that's like life. I want to thank the um, Reykjavik International Film Festival for having the nerve, taste, drive to bring you a selection of great films and great film artists. I want to thank great film artists for having um, the love of their own films to bring them to Reykjavik and to be here with us. And I want to thank all of you for your passion for cinema and for being here. And we love you.